Welcome to Middle School Science Module 5. This module will be covering life science or biology for the Praxis preparation. This is presented in partnership with TLC Tutoring Company and Arkansas State University. Now, we've already studied the structure and the makeup of atoms and molecules, so we're going to apply that knowledge to the structures and processes of life on Earth. The simplest unit that makes up a life is the cell, of which is a membrane-bound unit that contains everything needed to compose living things. Generally, there are two types of cells and two types of living organisms. There's the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. Now, prokaryotic cells do not contain any membrane-bound organelles. There's no subparts within a prokaryote. So, simple single-cell organisms such as bacteria and archaea, those are simple, no-membrane organelles. Then you have eukaryotes. Eukaryotic cells contain membrane-bound organelles, such as the nucleus or mitochondria. So these are the more complicated organisms you think of, like animals and plants. Eukaryotic organisms can be made up of just one cell, and we would call that unicellular, or made up of multiple cells, multicellular. So let's just start with a typical animal cell, and we're just going to hit the high points on the major pieces. So in an animal cell, you have a cell membrane. That's the outer permeable membrane that goes in and out of the cell. You have the nucleus, that center larger piece that contains the DNA and directs the cell. It's the, the center control area. The mitochondria, which is the power storage or the powerhouse of the cell is sometimes what you call it. The cytoplasm is the fluid that fills all the cell space between the various organelles. And then the ribosomes, which are involved in protein synthesis and RNA. Now, in comparison, this is a typical plant cell. It has many things in common, but there are some differences. So the, there's first, there is a cell wall outside the cell membrane. The cell wall is this rigid outer edge, and then you have the cell membrane, the protective permeable layer underneath. Then you have this larger area in the middle that is green called a vacuole. So this can store waste or water inside the cell, and this is unique to plants. There's also a nucleus that has the DNA. And there's also these green bits called a chloroplast. So this is where the chlorophyll actually creates sugar for energy from sunlight. They do have mitochondria that is the power storage of the cell to convert the sugars into ATP. The cytoplasm, same fluid that fills the cell, and ribosomes to make protein synthesis. Now we talked about basic cells and living things. We want to take a minute to talk about viruses. And viruses are unique because they have some things that are living characteristics and some things that are not living. Now, viruses reproduce at a fantastic rate, but only in living host cells. They have to be connected to a living host cell to reproduce and to grow. And they can mutate. They have that ability to change. And that's one of those great indicators of living things. But they also have several non-living characteristics. They are acellular in that they have no cytoplasm or any cellular organelles. You can see the basic structure of a virus here on the right. And this says that they carry no metabolism on their own. They must replicate using the host cell's metabolic machinery. So they hijack a host cell and then make copies of themselves. They're unable to do it on their own. And the vast majority of viruses possess either DNA or RNA, but not both. So there are many things about them that are not really living. So viruses are a very unique part of our ecosystem. Now, as organisms get larger and more complicated, and they become multicellular organisms, organisms, they start having multiple levels of organization. So first is just the cell. And you can have cells to do all sorts of specific things. You can have nerve cells, you can have bone cells, you can have tissue, you know, all sorts of different kinds of cells. Then you start grouping those into tissues. So cells of the same origin and they carry out a specific function and they work together. So like nervous tissue, muscle tissue, connective tissue, those are groups of cells. And then you take groups of or of tissue or a structure made out of tissue and you get organs. They're made up of different tissues that make specific bodily functions. So your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, your brain, 
those are organs and then you have the organ systems that you have organs that work together to perform a similar function like your renal system which is waste removal your nervous system for nerve impulses your circulatory system for blood flow and oxygen management so as you get more complicated and the organism gets larger and more complex you have multiple layers of organization now, higher level organisms have these organs that work together to keep the organism healthy and working properly. So consider the cardiovascular system. That's the heart and blood vessels and the respiratory system, the nose and the mouth, the lungs, and all the connections in between. They must work together to ensure enough oxygen is available to all parts of the body and that carbon dioxide is removed. You can't do one without the other. They have to work together. These systems work to maintain what we call homeostasis, the state of steady internal, physical, and chemical conditions maintained by a living system. So, you know, if you're a warm-blooded creature like humans, our homeostasis is to maintain a certain body temperature, and your body works to maintain that temperature. And all living things strive to stay in balance so that they can survive. Now, there's several factors affecting growth of an organism. So you have environmental and genetic factors. So environment is just the things that surround the organism, you know, whether it's a plant or an animal or a fungus, you know, temperature and light and salinity, especially if it's, a, if it's an aquatic animal, drought, nutrition, insects, pests, all of these are environmental external factors that affect how well something grows. And now there's genetic factors. These would be internal things, things that have to do with even in the best environment this could be a problem so this might be disease resistance or feed conversion efficiency how quickly you can convert food to energy you know breeding and abnormal growth rate all of these things are genetic and not particularly affected by the environmental factors now Obviously, cells must be able to grow and reproduce in order to survive. That's one of the indicators of a living thing. There are two major ways that cells reproduce and grow. So first is mitosis. This is when a cell reproduces by dividing its cytoplasm, its organelles, and its cell membrane in one cell into two new cells having roughly equal shares of all the components. And the two new cells are genetically identical. So this is almost like cloning. So this is found in all eukaryotic cells to renew and grow the organism. So when your body needs to make, you know, new liver tissue, or you need to make, you know, when you're growing and your bones are getting longer, this is all being done by mitosis, where it's just cloning you, basically, making copies and expanding, and everything is genetically identical to you. Every cell in your body is genetically identical. Then we have meiosis, this is used in sexual reproduction as the parent cells separate and the male and female cells fuse into a single cell with two copies of each chromosome. This is called a zygote. So meiosis is only utilized during sexual reproduction. When you're when the having the reproduction process, you get a new copy that's different. So, you know, a human baby has a combination of their parents' genetic material, and that is through meiosis. Then as the baby continues to grow and make get bigger and make copies of its own cells, that's mitosis. Now, as we're talking specific organism, in plants, reproduction can be sexual or asexual. So vegetative asexual production is when you get new plant individuals without seeds or spores. So this is, you know, when grass is spreading out across uh, an area you don't want it to grow. This is where it's it simply is replicating itself. And it's these are all genetically identical copies. There's no seeds and there's no spores. But plants can also reproduce sexually, where they're going to use stamens and pistils, that's the male and the female organs, to produce seeds that combine traits of both parent plants. So this is what Gregor Mendel is famous for studying, as we'll get into. And looking at how plants do reproduce, how traits are passed on, and how they go with that. Uh, now, many plants exist symbiotically with animals to fertilize and spread their seeds. So you think about bees, and you know butterflies many insects that do the pollination to spread the two pieces to allow the plants to have genetic diversity and to be adapted to even make this process more efficient and effective where they want that bee to come to them to get nectar so that it gets pollen on it and it goes to the next plant now in animals <clears throat> reproduction in animals is sexual 
and can so this is the fertilization of the zygote can be done internally internal fertilization or outside external fertilization of the body of the female so external fertilization usually happens in aquatic environments so there's coordination between the male and female animals the creatures is critical so this is very common in fish, crustaceans, mollusks, and other invertebrates. There are environmental and biological, so this could be water temperature, or daylight, pheromone cues that cause the male and the females to release their gametes at the same time. And in this situation, the male and the females are not interacting with each other as individual, but massed together. So all the sperm and all the eggs are in the same location and then they can bond. In other species, including many amphibians, Individual males court individual females to induce the female to release eggs, at which point the male releases the sperm to fertilize that individual female's eggs. Both cases are very common in the animal kingdom. Now, internal fertilization occurs most often on land-based animals, though some aquatic animals do use this method. So, fertilized eggs once they have been internally fertilized, can be laid outside the body, and that's you know, birds and amphibians or reptiles, and retained in the female's body and emerge fully grown. So that's you know, sharks and lizards and vipers. You know, or retained in the female's body, receiving nourishment from the female through a placenta. This is what generally mammals, most mammals, and some fish and a few reptiles all generally use. Animals have a number of reproductive adaptations to increase this success, such as the parental investment, trying to make sure that the children, the offspring grow. Direct male competition is that you have males competing for the ability to reproduce. This puts pressure and helps make sure that you get the best, um, the best spreading of genetic information, as well as attraction appearance to connect mates. You know, this is like why a peacock is so beautiful. It's there to attract females so that they can reproduce and pass on their genes. Now, in living things, we've talked about energy and matter previously. So in living things, the energy and matter flow has special molecules and processes to do that. So the first and the most important potentially is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. This is an organic compound that provides energy to drive many processes of living cells. ATP is found in all forms of life on Earth and generated by the mitochondria organelle. So sometimes you'll hear that called the powerhouse of the cell. This is where we manufacture ATP. Now, sugars are the primary energy source in the living cells. So sugars, and primarily glucose, are transformed into ATP for use in the cell. Sugars can quickly provide energy to a living creature. So the whole idea of a sugar high is a real thing. Your body can convert that sugar quickly into ATP to give you a quick energy boost. Now, in plants, obviously, there is a different process. This is photosynthesis. This is a case where solar energy is absorbed and converted into sugars using the chlorophyll located in the chloroplast organelle. This sugar is converted to ATP for use as energy in the plant, and that's happening in the mitochondrion. Now, the concept of cellular respiration. So, you have a, a respiration when you're breathing in and out, but cells, in the same way, <clears throat> are breathing in their own way. This is a set of metabolic reactions and processes to convert chemical energy from oxygen or other nutrients into ATP and to release the waste products. So this is the general equation for aerobic respiration. So we start with glucose and oxygen, and we're going to make carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. So this is an exothermic reaction that is releasing energy that can then be used by the cell as it does the process. And note, the respiration is the opposite of photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, the plant absorbs oxygen and exhales CO2 to make the ATP. So it runs in both directions. Fermentation is another way. This allows for the production of ATP without any O2 required. Energy is still drawn from the carbohydrates, but the reactions are structured differently because there's no oxygen. The formulas vary depending on the specific sugar and the enzymes present, but here's a typical glucose reaction. Is the glucose is broken down to lactate or lactic acid and to ATP energy. So because it's done by many bacteria and yeast, and we're used that to make yogurt and bread and wine and biofuels, when you have fermentation and you've used that at home, if you've done something like that, you know what that looks like. 
Now, human muscle cells use the same formula when they can't get enough oxygen to meet their energy needs. So when you're exercising really hard and your muscles start to burn, that is that lactate building up in your muscles and it causes soreness and pain until it is processed and broken down with aerobic, uh, aerobic uh, respiration. Now, all organisms detect and respond to stimuli from their environment. Now, stimuli could by, you know, be sight or indication of food, the sound of a potential predator, the smell of a mate, decreasing temperatures, light intensity, weather changes, or even interactions with humans. One of the defining things that makes something alive is that response to stimuli. So this is something we should reliably see in all living things. And that wraps up Module 5, Life Science, for Middle School Science Review. Module 6 will talk about ecosystems, their interactions, energy, and dynamics. Thank you very much.